Hello and welcome to 10 Lessons It Took Me 50 Years to Learn, the only podcast that makes the world better lesson by lesson. My name is Robert Hossery and I'll be your host for this episode. Our guest today is Ambassador Niels Marquardt. Welcome, Niels. Welcome to the show. Good to see you again, Robert. Just a little brief background on Niels. Niels is a former American diplomat who now serves as the first ever diplomat in residence at the Lewis and Clark College. This follows a very long career in the U.S. State Department. After leaving in 2013, Niels became the CEO of the American Chamber of Commerce in Australia and led that organization for four years where I had the pleasure of working with him. Niels is also Consul General for the United States in Sydney. He was the ambassador to Madagascar in the Union of Comoros. Uh, He was the U.S. ambassador to Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea. Niels first entered the State Department in 1980 and ultimately served every U.S. president from Jimmy Carter to Barack Obama. Niels has had postings in Thailand, the People's Republic of Congo, France, Germany and Under the leadership of Secretary of State Colin Powell, Niels led the department's Diplomatic Readiness Initiative, managing the largest increase in the State Department's recruitment and hiring and training in decades, and preparing the American diplomacy for intense challenges post the 9-11 era. If you think that Niels has spent all his life in the State Department, you're probably right, but before that, Niels was also in the Peace Corps. He volunteered in Zaire and Rwanda, teaching English at the National University of Rwanda. Ambassador Niels Marquardt has earned a master's degree at the National War College, the Thunderbird Graduate School of Management, and he currently serves on the board of the Portland-based International Youth Silent Film Festival. Youth Silent Film Festival. We'll talk about that in a second, Niels. On Lewis and Clark Sustainability and Global Advisory Boards and on the American Australian Veterans Scholarship Fund. Niels is also a member of the Oregon Consular Corp. Wow. Niels, that just went on and on. You have not retired. You are still as busy as ever. Welcome to the show. Great to see you again. How have you been? I've been great. Uh, It's hard to believe it's been four years since I left Australia. As you know, Judy and I left our our daughter there, so we still have a connection. And in fact, she's getting her citizenship next week. This is our third daughter, Torin. So uh, we'll be back as soon as uh, you've got planes flying again across uh, the Pacific. Well, hopefully that will be soon, sir. Hopefully that will be very soon. But you you have been very, very busy. You you haven't stopped since you went back to Oregon. Well, I, I put together a lot of, I would call them little gigs that, you know, add up to, I think, a pretty interesting existence here. You know, I don't have to worry about trying to make money, which is a really nice change. And um, so all of the things that I do are voluntary and uh, unpaid. And so, you know, I can come and go. I mean, lately there's not been a lot of coming and going, but I do have plans to go to the Middle East uh, for Christmas because we have another daughter who lives in Qatar and grandchildren there. That's a that's a development since I last saw you, uh, a grandson and a granddaughter. And, oh, congratulations! Uh, and then uh, I'm going on a Lewis and Clark College alumni trip to Antarctica in January. So um, yeah, so lots of fun things. I would say come together to make a full life here. And that's why I thought of you when we started putting this project together. When we're talking about 10 lessons, it took me 50 years to learn. Your breadth of experience, especially your international breadth of experience, led us to to think that the kind of lessons that we could learn from Niels Marquardt would be valuable. Valuable to our listeners, valuable to us, because of the fact that you have experienced these things, you've learned your lessons in life on, I would say, what, about five, six, seven different countries in your career? I think the total is 11. I was 11 per group of students. So yeah, uh, 12, including my own country. So yeah. If we look at that from a cultural perspective, that's phenomenal. That opens up the ability to understand humanity from multiple different angles. So it makes your lessons, at least to me, Niels, and hopefully to our audience, it makes your lessons even more valuable. And I want to say again, thank you for making the time to be here with us 
today. And we'll just jump straight into your 10 lessons. You may have to explain some of these, by the way, because okay. some of them could be a little cryptic. <laughs> I will definitely provide examples. All right, let's start with lesson number one. Don't worry about what other people are thinking of you. I, uh, I never do, and I think you know that, but still, I mean, that is a, a, a very unique lesson. Why would you not worry about what other people think of you? Well, I think I, I meant it specifically in the, I mean, I, I spent so much of my career uh, at a distance from people that I was working with, uh, emails and telegrams and cables and occasional phone calls. Uh, were my connection, my lifeline back to headquarters. And, uh, you know, sometimes you get uh, an answer to a question or an instruction that was very clear. And other times it, it were kind of raised more questions than it answered. And uh, I think it's very easy. And that's not just for diplomats. I think anybody dealing through social media or email or whatever your medium of choice is, it's very easy to start to read things into mainly things that people don't say and wonder what they really meant and sort of go off, get, you know, start playing head games and waste time and invent scenarios that are really quite often destructive and unhelpful. And in fact, people just aren't thinking about you. People are thinking mostly about themselves. And when they leave things out, uh, I think it's a very unhealthy uh, habit to get into trying to guess and you're just guessing what it is that they really might have meant or might be thinking about. They are not thinking about you. So go back and, and ask the question that you have. And don't, you know, the French have an expression that's called a poste d'intention. You know, don't start getting into that sort of practice where you're second guessing what somebody, you know, far or near or but away from you is trying to say, because they probably aren't trying to say anything. I'm laughing because you're spot on, and th this is something it took me a long time to learn. But uh, while, while, yes, you're, you're absolutely right, the terminology about not worrying about what other people are thinking about you. So what you're saying is they're not thinking about you. No. So <laughs> it, it's, you're the one uh, who's thinking about you and about the way you, you look to them and you, you present yourself to them. Yeah. It's a form of a, a, a great uh, flattery to think that you're so important that you're so <laughs> thinking about you to, to an extent that they simply are not, they may have answered your question briefly and moved on to the next thing, which is usually a good practice and work and business. And you know, there you are left wondering what they really meant. Well, they probably didn't mean anything. So. You know, it's just, uh, in fact, I learned that lesson. I mean, I heard that expression in Australia from one of my colleagues at Amcam who just, you know, he, he just said that, you know, it's like, they're not thinking about you at all, you know, so move on, you know. I, I love that because it's so true. And it takes a lot of people a long time to realize this. Mm -hmm. um, basically, get your ego out of the way and just get on with the job. Uh, mm -hmm. Niels, you're spot on. Okay, well, let's move on to lesson number two, which, I, and I have no idea what this means, so you're going to have to explain it to me. The 90% rule. What really struck me, you know, the stick department is, uh, you know, again, a lot of my examples will come out of the place that I spent just under half my life working, so you'll forgive me for that. But the stick department is a place that's very process-driven very hierarchical, you know, for an idea to ever really see the light of day, uh, it needs to go up the chain and across the field and everyone has to chime in and say, check, 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 check. Uh, you know, it's okay. We call it the clearance process in the state department. And it's one of the most inefficient and odious things that I had ever encountered in my professional life. And again, unfortunately, it's quite a big part of the state department and there's a reason for it. You obviously want to make policy that takes into account every angle. But you just find that in working on projects there that, you know, you spend 50% of your time on the, you know, the last 10 yards to use a football analogy to the extent possible, you know, I, none of us, I think anybody in the state department would lament the excesses of the clearance process and none of us have the power to change it individually, but to the extent you have control over what you're doing in your day. You know, when you get to be about 90% of the way through most of the work that you, that you've done. Uh, that's, that's a good place to, to just say, okay, that's good enough because the rest of the time you're going to be oscillating and 
burnishing and changing happy to glad and uh, you know, a lot of this is written communication uh, that I'm talking about, but uh, it just doesn't matter. You know, it's if it's if you're 90 percent of the way there, move on to the next thing, uh, and I don't think anybody will really notice. So those are maybe two sort of overlapping ideas there. You will be so much more productive if you just don't worry about the last 10 percent. I hear you. I understand what you're saying. Is there? in your experience outside of the State Department, maybe in a, in a life situation, an example of that 90% rule? Um, well, I have a friend who, you know, does a lot of embroidery in, in, in uh, crafts and things like that. And uh, she calls her website something like Galloping Horses. And she does a lot of detailed stitching and things like that. So she says, if you can't see the mistake from a galloping horse, then don't worry about it. <laughs> I think it's the same thing. You know, it's like it is good enough. And, and we get so obsessed about perfection, uh, which doesn't exist, by the way. When I was at the War College 25 years ago with a bunch of fighter pilots and ship drivers and submarine captains and people like that, I remember I was working on a paper back then, you know, nobody had a laptop or anything. We we're just sitting side by side in a room that was full of PCs and you know, I was doing that sort of happy to glad thing, and and uh, there's a pilot from the Air Force sitting next to me, and he looked over. And he said, "What's going on?" And I said, "Well, I'm, I explained. I was just going back and forth, and and I realized I was changing things back to what I had changed them from." And he goes, "Oh yeah, we call that pilot induced oscillation. You know, which is when you're driving your airplane, you want to go up, and you go down, and you go up, you go down, and you just can't get it right. So." Um, you know, we've got it in every profession. We do. And, and it's very clear that this happens all the time. And you're right. Uh, we've had a, uh, a guest on the podcast who said, perfect is not a destination because it's not, as you said, it doesn't exist. And you will be going backwards and forwards doing exactly the same thing. 90% rule. If you're 90% done, get on to the next thing. Very well put. I, I like that. And I, I can see the benefit in doing that. All right. Lesson number three, your passion may not lead to success, but pursue it anyway. Yeah. And again, I have to go back to the state department on this, you know, the whole issue of assignments. I mean, I, I said, I worked in uh, what, 12 different countries over mm -hmm. my career. And, you know, we care a lot about assignments in the State Department, good ones, challenging ones, career enhancing ones, places where you would want to live with your family or not. A lot of things to be concerned about. And, you know, along the way you get offers, you meet good people who have things that they care about. Uh, let's say people who are passionate about, uh, you know, the Middle East, for example. I mean, that's a real example from my, from my life. And, uh, you know, I, there was a point where somebody I really respected and asked me if I'd like to, you know, go work on, you know, Middle Eastern affairs. And I was torn because the person asking me was, would have been an appealing boss. But, you know, I just didn't want to take that leap into dealing with intractable issues of, you know, Israel and Palestine and Shia and Sunni and, you know, I mean, you spend your entire career working on that stuff and what, what at the end of it, what do you have to show for it? So, uh, you know, so I turned it down and said, no, I there's I don't want to go off in that direction. It might have been career enhancing. I might have, you know, who knows? I might have all kinds of great things might have happened. But like, why would I want to go down that rabbit hole? And so I think you think of four or five or six other sort of intersections in my career path uh, where... I turned down something that I really felt was not in line with the things that I was really interested in. So that's what I was trying to get out uh, with that one. And then, I mean, you know, we've had so many opportunities, if you want to call them that, in the State Department to go to places like Afghanistan and Iraq. And, you know, really, those can be very career enhancing. You know, you're taking personal risk on behalf of something that's a huge foreign policy priority. I didn't accept any of those. I was once offered the, the number two slot in Iraq and, uh, you know, I was just like, no, thank you. I guess that, yeah, I wasn't interested in it. I didn't feel like I was qualified for it. I felt for sure there had to be people that knew Arabic or some Arabic or you know, knew more than I did. They had to be 
better qualified. And, you know, if the only reason for doing it was career enhancement or ambition, then how does one feel when you make that decision and you don't get rewarded? You know, and there's no guarantee that you are going to get rewarded for those kinds of trade-offs. So, you know, I think you just have to stay true to yourself and do the thing that you think is interesting and that in line with why you have chosen whatever your profession is. Maybe it's more dramatic in the foreign service when you're choosing between, you know, Iraq and Buenos Aires or something, but we all make those kinds of choices. And I, I, I just really feel bad for those people who, who think they're going to be rewarded for doing something they want to do. And then they're never rewarded and they, you know, live with resentment and regret. That never happened to me. And having worked with you for four years, it's very obvious that your choices have resulted in your leadership style. Your choices have resulted in, in your humanity and the way you approach other people. And, and I've, I've always appreciated that. So if I can just summarize or at least try and boil down what you, you said, if you were giving advice to people today, you would be telling them to follow their passion, even if it doesn't lead to a financial reward or a financial gain at the end of the day. Financial or otherwise. Yeah. And, and I also think the corollary to that, I mean, I think actually I'd like to put this in a positive frame, which is in fact, you're more likely to succeed doing something that is in line with your passion than when you're doing something that may be somebody else's choice of what they think you'd be good at or that you should do. I think you're more likely to succeed when you're aligned with your passion. That actually is an excellent point to solidify this lesson that nobody knows you better than you. Correct. Don't let someone else decide what you're good at and what that's, you want to do. I absolutely believe that. That's very well said, Robert. No, that, that's your lesson, Nils. That, that, is, that is excellent. So lesson number three was... Your passion may not lead to success, but pursue it anyway. And listeners, this is a very valuable lesson out of all our podcasts, out of all the lessons that we've had so far, this is one of the most powerful ones. So if you need to rewind and listen to this lesson again, I'd strongly urge you to do it. All right, let's move on. Lesson number four, and this is something I absolutely agree with because I probably have done it myself. Lesson number four, we are probably our own worst enemy. Well, in the job that I have, the volunteer job I do at Lewis and Clark, my main job is advising students on potential career paths that would take them overseas. And there are a lot of students at this particular college that, uh, you know, study abroad and come back and sort of wonder, you know, what to do next. So in fact, yesterday I was giving a presentation with, on that very topic with um, obviously a bit of a focus on the foreign service for those that might want to become diplomats themselves. And it really was, it struck me how the odds of actually getting through the sort of gauntlet of tests and other obstacles is difficult. And, you know, the numbers are not good. And there are many things in life where you kind of look at the numbers, you go, well, I'm not going to get picked for that. I mean, I was recently on the Fulbright committee to help the student, help students and graduates of Lewis and Clark trying to get accepted for Fulbright scholarships and fellowships abroad. Again, very competitive. The odds aren't very good. And it just brought me back to what I felt when I was in my twenties and, uh, you know, I didn't, I wasn't overconfident, you know, and some people have the problem with being overconfident. I never had that problem. And, you know, you look at something like a career in diplomacy and you sort of look around at who else is applying and they're at, you know, maybe they went to better schools or they come from better families or they have, you know, a better background. They've traveled more, they speak foreign languages better and maybe speak more of them. I don't know. It's so easy to psych yourself out. And, uh, you know, I've just found in the course of my own career that, that, you know, that's a very destructive self-defeating habit to the extent you can. Buck yourself up and convince yourself that you're worthy and don't let, don't play main games in your head where you are looking at other people in, in your sort of peer group and, and, and ascribing superhuman qualities to them to your detriment. And I, I find that talking to students all the time and they're just thinking, well, you know, I, I, how's that going to happen to me? And it's like, you know, somebody's going to get that job or somebody's going to get that fellowship and why not 
you, you know? You can't talk everybody into a high level of success, but uh, the converse, you know, talking yourself out of, you know, high level of success, I think that's pretty common and should be avoided. It's very common. And I, I, I love what you just said. Why not you? How many times have we all, and we've all done it, talked ourselves out of it, been our own worst enemy, as your lesson points out. And it's to, to be aware of it, to be conscious of it is important. Uh, to know that you're doing that to yourself, you're undermining your own success by not giving yourself the chance to be successful in right. whatever you're trying to do. Yeah. It doesn't mean you will be. What's that old saying? Um, if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're right. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. Excellent lesson, Niels. Lesson number five. This is something I've always subscribed to, and I know you have, and I'd love to hear your story on this. Instill pride in others. Yeah, I think, you know, I was, uh, well, you mentioned in, in your introduction that I worked on this uh, diplomatic readiness initiative, which I thought about a lot this week because of the passing of Colin Powell, who was really one of the great men that I ever met and had the privilege of working anywhere close to. I, can't, I wasn't a close associate of his, but, you know, I saw him a number of times and what I was doing was important to him. And it was important to me to be successful because he wanted to be successful. But uh, the, the lesson on it was, you know, I got a call one day it said, and, and, they, and they said, I know you have a job and it's not this job, but you're going to be doing a different job and it's going to be running this diplomatic readiness initiative, which is a new thing in the State Department and it's important. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a request, it was an order. And I said, absolutely, I'll do it. And I did it for three years. So most of Colin Powell's tenure as, State, as Secretary of State, you know, I was there working on this project, which was extremely successful under his leadership. And I think I would give him, you know, obviously I'd give him the full credit for it because he gave us the tools and the resources that we needed. But the interesting thing that gets to this lesson was the team that I could pull together to work on this was, I think I used the word dream team in my, the way I could express this lesson. You don't always get your dream team, but you still have to achieve your goals and you, and instilling pride in the effort is part of it, that success. And so we told people that didn't have jobs. And I mean, and some people said, here, you take this person and so we put together a really diverse team of people from extremely different backgrounds. Uh, some had just gone through, you know, been pulled back from overseas because there had been a family tragedy. You know, all, you know, everybody had a story, and, and uh, except me, really. <laughs> I'd just been given the job. And, uh, you know, so we were all on this team, and it was one of the greatest experiences of my life, just uh, achieving the positive result that we were aiming for with this team that was, you know, kind of accidental. And every step of the way just making, and people you could see they were proud to get, I mean, they were proud to be on Colin Powell's team, you know. It was really a lot about him. I mean, the State Department in the 90s was so beaten down. Uh, I mean, if I can say it's been, it's a little bit like it has been, was the last four years, really beaten down, under-resourced, underappreciated, underutilized. Uh, and then the law comes Colin Powell and says, hey, we're printing this around and you guys are going to better get up to speed. So we actually put him on the poster that was, you know, all over the country and all over the uh, internet. And it said a picture of Colin Powell looked a little bit like sort of Uncle Sam, not a ridiculous hat. <laughs> and it said, you know, this man has a very important job for you. And 9-11 uh, came along. That was a bit of a speed bump. And uh, two weeks later, we had the Foreign Service exam take place in 2001, September of 2001. We had tripled the number of people sitting for the exam than had taken it in, uh, in probably decades. And so they just, we had to stop and just celebrate the successes along the way and make sure everybody was, was feeling proud of what we were able to do. And I think, I really think they did. And that's, that's a nub of the lesson. It wasn't so much that you were incredibly successful because you guys were great. The nub of the lesson is that you instilled that pride. Um, your boss, Colin Powell, instilled that pride in you. You instilled that pride in your team so that everybody in the entire project is 
was proud of the result of the product that they were producing. That's true. And I'll just say, you know, something about the state department culture in the state department culture, historically working on human resource issues has not been seen as the sexiest thing to be involved in. Right. And so along comes Colin Powell and he says, like, you know, you take care of your troops. You can't do something with nothing. You need more people. They need to be the best people you can get. Go out and get them. He wrote that a note to me. He says, go get them, Niels. You know, I remember that. And so we went out and got them. And, uh, you know, today I just sent a note to somebody that was hired 19 years ago under this initiative who's now in a high position. So it's, it's actually the way you can see, I, maybe in my voice and my face is continuing pride over what this team was able to do. I can definitely see that. I can definitely hear it in your voice, Niels. And I experienced what you're talking about under your leadership at Amcham because you are still proud of what you were accomplishing there. You're proud of the team you had and what we were accomplishing there. And you instill that in us. So I, I understand the lesson and I can just say to our listeners, this is not rhetoric from Ambassador Niels Marquardt. This is, this is actual lived experience. This is something that Niels does because he believes in it and it works. Believe me, it works. So that's a great lesson, Niels. Thank you so much. Lesson number six is probably my favorite of your list. Actually, I like a whole list, but this one is just quintessentially Niels Marquardt for me. If you can't stay out of the way, you have hired the wrong person. I love it. You know, I mean, I think particularly an organization that, that, that can draw excellent talent as a manager, you need to have a light touch. You need to give minimal guidance, let people's creativity flow, let them grow in their jobs, uh, and let them step up and take ownership of the things that on paper it says they they are responsible for. And I know that my, I, myself, when somebody gave me detailed instructions about how to take on a challenge or a job, that that did not make my day. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, fine, tell me what the result you want, and I will figure out my way, my way of achieving it, and hopefully you'll be happy. And I think, look, I think most people like that. And if they if they don't like that, and they want you to tell them everything that they need to know, then you've got the wrong person in the job. And in the State Department, you don't get much opportunity to fire people. I mean, even as an ambassador, you have this ability to tell somebody they are no longer welcome at post and send them on, you know? And I never once did that. Uh, there were probably one or two times when I maybe should have, but I just felt like it was kind of like, it was like the nuclear option. And it, there had to be a way to be able to work with a person, unless they were really doing something, you know, criminal or immoral or something, but that I can't say that happened. Also keeping in mind that in uh, a lot of work situations, certainly if you're ambassador in a remote place like Madagascar or Cameroon, that is not the place that most people want to work. And, you know, getting quality people to come to places like that is, is a real challenge and uh, it takes a lot of sort of outreach. And so if you've got somebody on your staff, you've got to give them the benefit of the doubt because, I mean, if they leave, then, you know, it may be a long time before the next person comes and that person, next person may not be a superstar either. So, you know, you need to work with the people you've got. Um, so there's a little bit of a mixed message here. One is, you know, uh, you know, staying out of people's way. And the other is, you know, kind of doing what you have to do to make things work with the people you have on your team. I mean, it's certainly true. I mean, in the U.S. right now, you can't, you know, you can't go to a restaurant or, you know, or to a store and be waited on properly because people are not working. And uh, we, we won't get into all the reasons for that, but it, it, it sort of, I'm sure that there are a lot of managers around the country right now who are making do with what they've got and trying to get the best result possible uh, under less than ideal circumstances. It's an interesting lesson, Niels, because it flies in the face of almost every managerial consultants advice, which is get rid of your bad actors. Someone's not performing, get rid of them, get them out of the, the, the operation and get someone who will actually do the job. So it, it does fly in the face of that. I understand what you're saying and I hear what you're saying. I would like to perhaps offer 
this point of view, that if your hiring process is better to begin with, then you're not going to have as many of these issues. No, that's absolutely true. So if you, if you hire the right person and they've got the skills, they've got the talent, get out of their way. Yeah. And if, that's, that's my main, that's my yeah. main, you know, that's my main point. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I, I would like to offer the opportunity to the team to get better, to learn from their mistakes. There's a really, really old joke. Uh, it's old because I'm old, but there's an old joke. This is in the IBM days when they were selling mainframes and, you know, um, a salesperson had lost a $10 million deal and he walks into his boss's office with a resignation letter and he offers it and the boss looks at him and says, I'm not gonna fire you. I just spent $10 million educating you. <laughs> Really old joke, but the point is still there and the point is still valid. Train your people, get them to learn from the mistakes. Don't punish them for the mistakes. Yeah. Unless, of course, you know, they deserve to be punished for the mistake, but yeah. they're, they're your team. And that's what you're saying. That's exactly what you're saying. Get out of their way, but also encourage them. I mean, I, yeah, on this topic, though, ultimately, those consultants are right. If you've got somebody that really is not performing, uh, I think I wrote down they are, they can become a cancer on your organization. Everyone else looks at them and sees what they're getting away with, feels put upon because many of them are probably doing work that, uh, or cleaning up messes that, you know, the other person is causing. Yeah. We absolutely cannot let that happen. That is one of the worst things you can do for the health of your organization. Yeah. As I said, I can talk about lesson six forever, but let's move on to lesson number seven. Probably the simplest and most powerful lesson that we have is this one. So lesson number seven, listen. So yeah, it's an underrated skill, I think. And uh, particularly in uh, a leader or you know, CEO or an ambassador, it's very tempting to just you know, be telling people what you think they should be doing. But I mean, I think, I, I think back to my first day at Dan Cham with you and the other uh, state managers and really spending some time listening to what all you thought needed to be done. I, you know, the, the same thing when I went to Cameroon, uh, you know, I hadn't been in Africa for a long time. I had never set foot in Cameroon and, uh, and, you know, I sat down with my team there for an entire day, not that long after I got there to sort of hear them talk about what they thought the focus of our mission, our, our shared mission should be. It's pretty much the same thing I was trying to do in MCAM early on, although I came in with some pretty strong ideas already. <laughs> I guess it comes down to this is, you know, if you want to change the course of an organization, it's a lot more easy. It's a lot easier and it's going to be more successful to move it in the direction that the organization thinks it should go than to try to impose your own view contrary to what the, the team thinks. If you've got a lack of alignment between what you think should happen and, and what they think should happen, you've got a problem. But quite often by listening, you'll find enough, you know, let's say you get 70% commonality that you, know, that you agree on, that's the 70% you wanna focus on for success. And if, you know, if you're focused on the other 30%, you, you're really trying to twist arms and, and swim upstream and it's going to be a lot harder. So the point is both sides, anybody in, no matter where you are, no matter what position you're in, whether it's business, whether it's life, listen, mm -hmm. it's so simple. And as Neil's pointed out, it's such an underrated skill. It's, uh, you know, just, if you listen, anything can happen. And if you don't listen, very little will happen. <laughs> I like that. In terms of harnessing the energy. I and mean, I could go on on that one too, but, uh, uh you mind managing the clock, I think. I, well, I, I'd, I'd rather not, but yes, we have to, because our listeners don't want to be listening to, you know, us talk for three hours. Okay. That is a very good one. Thank you for that. Niels. Let's move to lesson number eight, which is really really interesting and i want to hear this if yeah. they don't know you they won't care so yeah i learned this the hard way <laughs> uh you know i mean there's no probably more remote place on the planet you know to be stuck in the middle of a political crisis than madagascar 
And uh, that was the experience I had there for three years, you know, kind of a slow boil political crisis, a coup, and then the aftermath of the coup. And, you know, I had, I had been in Cameroon before that. Uh, there'd been a change of government. Pretty much everybody in the State Department that dealt with African affairs had turned over or moved on to different jobs. And I had sort of uh, maybe got a little bit uh, overconfident about just, you know, that I could handle things. And then this problem came along, this coup in Madagascar. And I realized too late. And I, you know, I wasn't on the phone like, all the time talking to, or even often to talking to my, you know, senior colleagues in the department, my superiors, the people that could help me and the people that would have an impact on what I was able to do. And, you know, the, it was almost like a divergence and I went off this way and they went off that way. I mean, this was the beginning of the Obama administration. We had a new secretary of state, everybody was new. And at the beginning of the crisis, most of the people were in acting positions rather than confirmed positions. So they didn't feel confident in their authority anyway. But it, the results were not good because I was second guessed. I didn't know who was second guessing me because I didn't know them and they didn't know me. So they, there was nobody to pick up the phone and say, you know, and have a little, you know, honest conversation with this ambassador off on this, you know, Indian Ocean Island in the midst of political chaos. And, you know, we ended up with some very undesirable outcomes, like having the determination made in Washington against my will that everybody should be evacuated from the, the embassy, all the families, my family, a lot of people who were deemed to be uh, non-essential personnel, which is what happens uh, in a crisis. And yet, you know, we ended up, the United States ended up being the only embassy, the only country that evacuated its people. We look really stupid. And, you know, and I could, I knew that, but I was unable to convey that in a persuasive way to, you know, people in Washington. So I just realized, you know, I may be the chief of mission, I may be the president's personal representative, and maybe all these things that, you know, that ambassadors sometimes convince themselves that they are. But in the, in the end, you're just another cog in the wheel, and you better know who the other cogs are, and uh, and work closely with them to avoid outcomes that you really don't want to live with. I mean, it wasn't fatal to anybody, you know, happily, but it wasn't pleasant. So the the upshot of all of this is that because you weren't in, I mean, putting aside the, the new administration and the turmoil, because you weren't in communication with head office, yeah, they didn't know who you were. Yeah, and I think, you know, going back to my first lesson, I mean, they probably did, you know, they did imagine things about me that, you know, that weren't, that weren't helpful. <laughs> so, so keep yeah. the communication up. Let people know who you are. Know who you are, you know, and just, just invest in those relationships before you need to cash them in. <laughs> oh, I like that one. Listeners, this is what you should here invest in the relationships before you cash them in that is a, a very good way to round off that lesson that's very good lesson number nine you're a very family orientated man we know this and lesson number nine who do you work for <laughs> well it's true you know it's like uh, you work for your family you know and you know ultimately now it's been what i've been retired from foreign service eight years i was last an ambassador 11 years ago that's all really heady stuff you know so i would i haven't been to amcham in four years and it, you know you just when you, when it's all over all you've got is your family and you know you want that to be a, a place you return to that is supportive and loving and where you don't have regrets about what you should have done or would have done in terms of building those most important relationships. So, you know, I think you have choices along the way in your career. Again, the foreign service is more dramatic than most places because you're talking about uprooting, you know, everybody changing schools, changing languages, changing cultures, changing climates. I mean, everything changes when you go from France to Australia to 
Yeah, we're in, you know. So keeping your eye on the uh, what's what's good for the kids. I mean, the story that uh, you know that brought it out to me the most was after well about about twenty years ago, I had a very good relationship with the director general of the Foreign Service, who was sort of my boss's boss, and uh, he was actually named ambassador to Australia, and I had never set foot in Australia, and of course. I mean, you, I hope you Aussies know how much every American loves your country and wishes they could go there. And if you're a diplomat, I mean, we saw that, you know, in Sydney when, you know, they told everybody that went to Iraq or Afghanistan, they could choose where they went, went after Iraq or Afghanistan. And God knows how many people we had in that consulate general that had come from Iraq and Afghanistan. But, you know, 20, year, 20 years ago, when I, I was offered the chance to go to Canberra, uh, when this, when this, ambassador was assigned as ambassador to Australia. And you know, he called me up to his office and we'd worked together. I you know, I really hadn't known him that long, but we worked together really well. And he said, uh, Niels, I'd really like you to go be my deputy in Australia. And and I was, you know, just immediately turning through my head was this is this is the only opportunity I'm ever going to have to go live and work in this wonderful country, Australia. And when I turned to him I said, you know, I'm gonna have, I don't even have to take this one home to my wife or think about it overnight, or all the usual things that people say, So I have to tell you, I can't do it. I cannot do it. At the time, we had a medical issue in the family, and it would just have been way too selfish, really, for me to do that. So I turned him down, and I just thought, well, I'm never going to Australia. And I mean, there is some poetic justice, because 10 years later, of course, I ended up being assigned as Consul General to Sydney, which is I think uh, you know most Australians would probably agree a better job than being the deputy in Canberra. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. better city, not as cold. Yep, you're right. Yeah. I mean, you know, Canberra gets doesn't get a fair shake. It's a great place, but uh, it's not Sydney. <laughs> it, it's not. But the the nub of your lesson is, and, and it's been said by many of our guests, your family is important. Work will any place you work will fire you without a, a moment's hesitation if you're not right, if you're not the yeah. right fit, if you, you, you're not, not productive for them. Yeah. They owe you nothing. Your family will always be there. So well, at this point in my life, I can remember the, the family things that I missed. I mean, I didn't attend a single one of my daughter's college graduations, which are, you know, let's face it, they're a little bit overrated. As, <laughs> As, as events. But That's I was, not the point you're making. That's not the point. No. But I mean, for every single one of them, I was overseas somewhere and I just couldn't be there. My wife was there for all of them, I will say happily. And I don't remember what it was that I was doing instead. <laughs> and isn't, isn't that the point? Yes, you weren't yes. there because something was so important, you had to be elsewhere. Yep. Whereas you would remember being at your child's graduation, yep. but you can't remember where you were instead of your child. Let me, let me make this very clear, listeners. This is an important, a very, very important point that Niels brings up. If it's so important uh, that you be elsewhere other than your family, then why can't you remember where you were instead of that family gathering or that family event? And that's the lesson that brings home this point. So who do you work for? You're there for your family. Everyone else is pretty much not, doesn't really care about you as much as you think they do. And from Niels and I, believe me, we both experienced that in our careers. All right, let's move on to our 10th and final lesson, Niels. This is uh, lesson number 10. And I'm really glad to hear this because I've made many of them. You can <laughs> recover from your mistakes. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's again, it's the first, there are a number of the lessons are about not psyching yourself out. And uh, uh, I think, you know, we, te we tend to sort of, you know, when we do make a mistake, and we all do, uh, we tend to ascribe to it a much greater weight or permanency. I'll never recover from this. And, you know, I, I, what I've just found is when you make a mistake, it's uh, probably the last person to forgive you is yourself. Uh, everybody else, assuming you're, <laughs> it's not a regular habit, you know, everybody else is going to be a lot more forgiving of, of those events than you are. 
And then the other way I put it was, you know, it's always brighter in the morning. You know, you just at the end of the day, whatever's happened has happened. And I can think, you know, we can all think back to a number of moments where we just thought gloom and doom, horrible day. I really, it may be, I've made a fatal error here. I mean, fatal is probably not the right word, but a very serious error. And you wake up in the next morning after you've finally gotten to sleep. And not only is it not as serious, but you've already started to figure out how you're going to mitigate whatever damage you've done, what the next step is going to be. You know, I, when I was in Cameroon, you know, because I listened so carefully to my staff, they convinced me that I should make a really big public speech about corruption in this very corrupt country where nobody talked about corruption and only the American ambassador could possibly broach the subject uh, and get away with it. And so, you know, so they talked me into it and I thought it was a great idea. I gave this blistering speech that was on national television in Cameroon. And, you know, there's just this big silence, big public silence, big headlines too, you know, but a big public silence. And, uh, and I thought, oh God, you know, maybe I'm going to be sent home, you know, because that's in diplomacy. They can do that. They don't have, I mean, that's look at Turkey today. They're talking about you know, sending diplomats home because the president didn't like what they said. That, that happens. So, you know, I just went through a period of a few days where I just didn't really know had I made a mistake or not. Well, it turned out it wasn't a big, it wasn't a mistake at all. It was the best thing I ever did. And it was the most successful thing I could have done. And it completely changed the whole uh, impact of uh, my tenure as ambassador to Cameroon. Now, I'm not claiming that I cleaned up corruption. It's still a great corrupt. <laughs> you don't have to edit that out. It's just a statement of fact. But it turned out to be a really good thing. And what I thought initially had been a big overreach and a big mistake turned out not to have been that at all. The lesson that you can recover, that wasn't a mistake. So you, you didn't need to recover from it, but it's a, it's a great anecdote to, which, which shows that you spent, a, you I thought, thought for a period of time now, yeah, going back to your lesson and I will use you know, perhaps things in my career that have happened to me. I have, I have lost positions. I have lost big deals. I have ended relationships and, and friendships. And you know what? Ladies and gentlemen, that I recovered from that. I got a new job. I got you know new friends. The, the people I ended with, we're still on good terms. So it's not a, going back to one of Neil's previous lessons. It's not as bad as you think it's going to be. Absolutely not. But you will recover. We had a um, one of our most, more popular podcasts with a guest called Andrew Tyndale. One of his lessons was very simple. It was this too shall pass. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. And it will. Yeah. Uh, just like, just like this, this health crisis we've all gone through in the last two years, this too shall pass. So it's not as bad as you make it out to be and you will recover. Well, Niels, there were 10 wonderful lessons, but now let me ask you a very different lesson from you. In your 50 plus years in business, in, in, in work life, in, in life in general, is there a lesson that you have unlearned something that you believed in something that you held on to then, but now through the years, through wisdom, through experience, you've decided, no, that wasn't the right thing uh, to believe in, or that wasn't the right thing to do. So what have you unlearned? Well, look, I think now with the luxury of a lot of time to think about things and uh, no career pressures on me, I, I think when I look back, I, I, I'm very aware of the extent to which kind of ambition and, you know, with it, ego can be an excessive driver of things. And that I was very happy to be successful in the State Department, to be named an ambassador and all the things that came with it and after. But I, you know, if I had to do it over again, I would frankly just tone it down, turn it down a little bit and not, not have been in such a hurry and not have been in such a competitive mind frame, uh, you know, comparing my career with uh, the, that of my peers. And, you know, life is, uh, you know, it's a trite thing to say, but you know, it's a journey, it's not a destination. And, you know, so when you end up in retirement, you know, in your early sixties, I mean, I, I'm happy to be retired. So that, I'm, I'm going the wrong direction there, but 
you can look back and just realize that uh, you could have taken a more leisurely path, uh, smelled the roses along the way, and probably still been just fine. You know, and uh, you know, I see some of my some of the people that I started with in the Foreign Service now almost 41 years ago, uh, or just over 41 years ago, are still there. Uh, they took a more leisurely path and still achieved great heights. And you know, I'm not saying I wish I was still there. I don't. Uh, but I, I, I think being in a hurry to get through life is, that's a mistake. <laughs> it is. It's very interesting that you, you see the rush and the ambition and the ego. And mind you, I agree with all of that, by the way. You would have people say, well, you know, that's what makes, makes us great. That's what makes people successful. But how much do you miss out on the way? No, I think that's true. And I think it, it's important to have ambition. But I think the ambition should be channeled into a collective ambition and not yeah. an individual ambition. Uh, you know, pride in other success as much as your own. Uh, and those are hard things to live, though. So. I, I, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. If we go back and look at all your 10 lessons, Neil, they all feed into each other. And mm -hmm. they all come up with exactly what you just said. We did also have a guest, just to, to go back a second, we had a guest. Uh, Andrew Basevich, you may or may not know who oh, yeah. one of his lessons was ambition causes blindness. And oh. that is just so, so crystal clear. And it backs up everything that you have just said. Personal ambition, ego driven ambition does cause blindness, causes your blindness. You don't see what you're missing out on. Mm -hmm. But if we, we take what you said and, and look at the collective, you know, ambition for a cause, ambition for a purpose uh, that benefits your community is a good thing and, and will lead to better things. And well, Niels, this has been absolutely wonderful. I have really enjoyed uh, our time with you today. I've enjoyed your 10 lessons and I'm sure our listeners have enjoyed your 10 lessons. Is there anything that you would like to leave us with before we sign off? No, I think that's uh, that's enough food for thought for me today. Uh, thanks for uh, asking me on to your podcast and uh, bravo for what you're doing to uh, create stimulating uh, conversation for, for everyone to listen to. No, I appreciate that, Niels. Thank you. And with that, I will just say you've been listening to the international podcast of 10 Lessons. It took me 50 years to learn. Our guest today was Ambassador Niels Marquardt. This episode is supported by the Professional Development Forum, PDF. PDF brings you seminars, webinars, parties, social media discussions, you name it, they've got it. And it's all free and it's all online. You can find them on the professionaldevelopmentforum.org. So we'd like to hear from you. Please leave us a comment, uh, a review, or send us an email at podcast at 10lessonslearned.com. That's podcast at 10lessonslearned.com. And we'll get back to you. Let us know who you want us to interview. Give us any ideas for future episodes. And go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the next episode of the only podcast on the internet that is changing the world, lesson by lesson. Thank you. And see you on the next episode of 10 Lessons It Took Me 50 Years to Learn.